Hey guys, my name is Francisco Hernandez and today I'm doing another episode in my Building the Shot series going over how I took this shot on the screen right here that I recently took at the Shutterfest conference in St. Louis. The shoot was organized by my friend and photographer Sam Own, who I was there primarily to assist but he was kind enough to let me take some photos so big thanks to Sam for letting me do that as well as the model Hillary for modeling. If you guys are not familiar with what this series is, it's a series that I started recently where I do pretty much everything I can to break down everything about how I took a certain photo that I'm going to be highlighting in every single episode. I've already done a couple of episodes from this series going over the images that are going to appear on your screen right now. All of those images. So in case you're wondering how I took those photos, you can check out the links that are going to be in the description area below for those videos or just check out the playlist that's in the top right corner of the screen. I definitely welcome feedback. So if you have any feedback at all after seeing this video, definitely let me know what that feedback is in the comment section below. Once again, this is the shot that I'm going to be talking about today and I want to briefly put it up before I put it down for a little bit because I do want to start talking about the gear because the gear choices that I made to take this shot were really important to how the shot was taken. When it comes to the camera, I use the Sony a7R 3 because of the high resolution that it offers, 42 megapixels, as well as the latest Sony cameras have improved battery life, which is something that's really important to me, especially if I'm going to be shooting all day. So I used it for the battery life and the high resolution, but you could have used any other DSLR as well. Now, when it comes to the lens that I used, I used the Sigma Art 105 1.4, which is a lens that I had previously stated that I wouldn't take with me whenever I traveled because of the extra weight and the bigger size. But honestly, I love this lens and I will actually suffer through that extra weight and the bigger size for the look that this lens can give you. When I went to the WPPI conference this past February, I only brought the Sony 85 FE 1.8 and the Samyang 35 1.4, but a friend brought their Sigma Art 105 1.4 so I ended up borrowing it and really liking the shot that I took with that lens and even made a building the shot video for that shot. And so I just decided I'll just bring it with me to photo conferences. One thing I will say is that I usually use the camera strap by Peak Design called the Slide. I usually use the light version of that, but whenever I use the a7R 3 with the Sigma Art 105 because of how heavy that setup is, I'll use the non-light version of that, that camera strap because if I use the light version of it, which is thinner, I know I'll feel the pressure on my shoulder more. In case you guys are wondering how that setup looks like, it looks like this. This is the Sigma Art 105 1.4 with the a7R 3 and actually a pinky grip right here on the bottom. It doesn't provide any sort of extra battery, but it makes it feel more comfortable in the hands. Uh, I definitely think this is an awesome combo for the unique looks that it gives me. But again, uh, it is a little bit heavy, so you definitely have to tell your back that before you start to carry all of this stuff at photo conference like Shutterfest. And in case you guys are wondering about the differences in the strap size between the light and the non-light, this is the thickness right here. This is the transmitter that I always use with my Godox lights. It has the plastic on there, which is why it looks ugly, but this is the X-Pro transmitter, also known as the Adorama Flashpoint R2 Pro transmitter. There's a non-pro version, which is the original, that has a hot shoe on top. The difference between, the main difference in my opinion, between that original version and this one is that the, um, the pro transmitter is simpler to use and easier to use for groups of lighting and the original is just a little bit more complicated, just a little bit, and has the hot shoe on top in case that's something that's important to you. There's actually a Mark II version of this transmitter, the Pro Transmitter, that my friend Robert Hall made a video on. So in case you guys want to know more about that transmitter, you can check out the video in the top right corner of the screen or in the description area below. The Mark II has more features that this one doesn't, as this one is an older one, and I believe they're the same price. So if you don't have any transmitters at all and you want to get a Pro Transmitter, I would probably recommend the Mark II version of that transmitter. When it comes to the lighting that we use, we use the Godox AD200, also known as the Flashpoint Evolve 200 as a main light, which is actually right here in case you guys want a visual. We used it with the Fresnel head because we were using the MagMod system for a good chunk of that day. And the bare bulb attachment, which I believe is better for fitting out modifiers, doesn't really play well with the MagMod system. We use the Godox AD200 with the 24 inch MagMod, MagBox, Softbox with the fabric diffuser which was actually handheld by my friend Sam, who once again organized the shoot, which he held with the Cheetah Stand C10 light stand. Although we did use the Godox 8200 as a main light, it was too much power for us, especially because of how we were exposing for the ambient light that was around us. So I would definitely recommend you guys shoot with something like a speed light if you're shooting in similar conditions, because even at 1 128th, which is the lowest that you can go on the Godox 8200, it was still too much power and we had to rely on TTL. Not a lot of people realize this, but whenever you shoot with any light that has TTL, you can go as much as three to four stops lower on your light shooting TTL than you can manually. And as I said before, I was shooting at 1 128th with the model Hillary 
and it was just too much power. So I had to use TTL to get to those lower outputs. I will show you guys examples of this with photos that I took of Hillary, but I wanted to show you a quick example of photos that I took of my friend Ned Stark that I took for this video, showing you guys that at 1 128th, it was just too much power. And then when I switched to TTL, it was exactly where I wanted it to be. And I also have a BTS for you guys as well. The Godox 8400 Pro is twice the power as the Godox 8200, but it can go as low as 1 256 power. And that's gonna be the same as the Godox 8200 at 1 128th. And although this might seem like it's too much power because I just said that the Godox 8200 was too powerful at 1 128th, we didn't need the rim light to be super soft, so we just moved it further back. And I believe we ended up using it at 1 128th power. I wanted to specifically use the Godox 8400 Pro as a rim light because it offers a modding lamp, which you guys can see right here. This is the modding lamp. This is only at 10%, but it can go as much as 100%. We used it at 63%, I believe, to see exactly how the light was gonna fall on the subject. That's the main benefit of using a mine lamp. So I wanted to use that as the rim light for that reason. The modifier that we used for the Godox 8400 Pro was the 24 by 24 inch foldable soft mux, which is a modifier that I always bring whenever I travel because it fits nice and small to about this size. And it also provides nice soft light, even though it's not too big, which is something that you would typically get with a larger modifier than a 24 by 24 inch soft box. One thing I do want to say about this softbox is that you typically use it with the Godox S-Type bracket, which is this one right here, which you can use the Godox 8200 with or other speed lights. But if you want to use this modifier with a strobe that has a bonus mount, you're going to need this mount right here. I'll leave links in the description area to where you can get the softbox with this mount. I wanted to quickly show you guys the Godox 8400 Pro with the mount, which is right here, as well as the bonus mount, the Godox S-Type bracket, which is also known as the Bowen's mount bracket for speed lights in the Godox 8200. And this is actually the 24 inch by 24 inch foldable softbox, which looks pretty small, small size of my hand, but it, actually, it can actually get pretty big. It doesn't look like it, but it can, it can get pretty big. This is the 24 inch by 24 inch, but there is actually a 31 by 31 inch softbox that I used to use. But one thing that I found with the 31 by 31 inch softbox is that when you shake it a little bit too much, it can kind of fall off, but the 24 by 24 inch is really sturdy compared to the 31 by 31. That setup, the Godox 8400 Pro with the 24 inch by 24 inch softbox was held by a nano stand, which isn't Manfrotto's nano stand, but a knockoff version, at least Sam told me this, and I couldn't find those stands on Amazon, so I ended up just buying the Manfrotto nano stand, but if I do find the knockoff versions, I'll go ahead and let you guys know in the description area below where to find them. All right, so now that we know the gear and the lighting that was involved for this shoot, let's go ahead and start talking about the exposure and everything else that was involved in taking this shot on the screen right here of Hillary. Again, big thanks to Sam for letting me shoot at this photo shoot. As I've done in other videos before, I'm showing you guys the final version first, but now let's go ahead and take a step back and show you the first couple shots that led up to this photo and forgive me for how they look like. This right here is the first shot that I ended up taking that night, which is just a hot mess. It's overexposed and everything, but I want you guys to really take in how the background looks, the, the exposure of the ambient around her, because it's something that doesn't change throughout all of the different photos that I'm about to show you. The settings that I chose for that background are ISO 640, ISO or shutter speed 100th of a second at F 1.4. I mentioned earlier that I took a shot at 1 128th and it ended up being too much power. Well, this is that shot. I shot with 1 128th, it was too bright, and I ended up shooting in TTL in a second. But one thing I do want you guys to consider because people have told me in the past, well, you don't need to shoot in TTL. You could have done a few other things. Well, I want to address those solutions and why I didn't use those solutions. The first thing that I could have done to correct this exposure is to move the light further and further back, which would have made it weaker and expose the subject correctly instead of overexposing the subject. But one thing that you have to kind of trade in in terms of getting that lower output is less soft light. And I love soft light, so I always have it as close as possible for that soft light, which is gonna be a bad thing in terms of exposure for this specific shot and why I ended up using TTL. The second thing that I could have done is to narrow down my aperture from f1.4 to something like f2.8, which would have brought down not the exposure of the subject only, but also the background exposure, and I didn't want that at all. And also, if I'm gonna be shooting with the Sigma Art 105 1.4, I'm gonna be using that f1.4 because of how expensive that lens is. The third thing that I could have done is lower the ISO, but just like stopping down the aperture, you're not only gonna affect the subject's exposure, but you're also gonna affect the background exposure by lowering the ISO. And that's something that I didn't wanna do, so I didn't do that. 
The fourth and last thing that I can think of that would lower the flash's output would be to use an ND filter for your flash. There was a time where I didn't even know these things existed, but Magmod also has in their gel kit an ND filter, which is gonna help lower that output in case you're in a situation like, like this, in a low light situation, where having the flash at the lowest output is gonna be too much. That's gonna be a perfect solution in case you have a flash that's only manual and doesn't have TTL. As I mentioned before, this shot is obviously too overexposed, but I could actually save it a little bit in post by bringing it down a little, which is exactly what I did in this shot. But the only thing that you'll experience whenever you barely are able to save a shot in terms of overexposure is that you'll notice some oranges or yellows in the skin that show up too prominently. But if I were to really like this shot, if I like the level of ambient behind her and I like the exposure on her, then I could have just maybe tweaked the colors in the skin tones and ended up with a shot I really like. So that's just something that you should consider as well. But as I said before, I felt like the shot was overexposed. So I shot with TTL and it brought it down to this level. Now this shot is underexposed. So the only thing I need to do is just bring up the exposure, which I ended up doing in post. And I brought it up one level up in exposure, which ended up in this photo right here. Since I did bring the exposure up one stop in post, if I wanted a straight out of camera version of this shot while I was shooting, the only thing that I would need to do differently in terms of my settings would be to use ISO 1250 instead of 640, shutter speed 1 50th instead of 1 100th. But at that point, you might be experiencing a little bit of blur if you or the subject moves or use whatever aperture is one stop wider than f1.4. At this point, I do like the shot a lot. I like the level of ambient light behind her. I like her expression. I like how the subject is not overexposed or underexposed in terms of the main light. But two things I do find myself not liking or how the rim light is showing up a little bit too much. So I do end up moving it more off axis. And I feel like the light quality in the main light could be a lot better. So I do end up putting the light closer. So although I'm at TTL zero here, I think I go to TTL minus one or minus 1.7 in a second. Again, this is the first shot that I took in TTL after that first overexposed shot. So I thought I did like everything about the shot at this point. So I ended up taking one more shot, which is this one right here at the same level of exposure, but then I ended up changing it in a second. After I took this shot, I not only asked Sam to bring the light closer, but a little bit more on top of her. So I want you to really focus on the shadows from this shot to the next one. I'll go ahead and throw both of them on the screen together so you guys can see exactly what I mean. But this is the next shot right here. This is the underexposed version. Of course, I tweaked it a little bit in post to bring it up to a level where I liked it, which is this shot right here. So this shot, aside from being a little bit underexposed and me kind of bringing up the exposure a little bit, is pretty much straight out of camera. But I want you guys to see the other shot straight out of camera with just that little bit of exposure tweaked so you guys can see exactly what I mean in terms of how the light's hitting her and how, how different the shots look like. So the most recent shot, the shot on the right, you can definitely see much more drama in terms of light, in terms of how the light's hitting her skin, as well as the more prominent shadows underneath her chin and on the sides of her arms and the side of her cheek. So I really like the drama that you get from this angle. So I really, really like this shot and ended up taking maybe two more shots with this exposure and this closeness of light. But as I said before, one thing I do change is how that rim light is hitting her from the back. So I do adjust that after this shot, as well as one thing I didn't like about this shot, even though I liked that extra punch that I was getting with having the light closer and at a more dramatic angle, was I wasn't liking that the flash looked too prominent. It looked too flashy and I wanted to bring more ambient into the shot. So although I do like this shot, it just wasn't exactly what I had in mind. So I ended up going ahead and just reducing that exposure from TTL zero to TTL minus 1.7. And the reason behind doing that is because although I do like the shot, I feel like the flash is too bright on her. It's making her too much like a pop out and not kind of giving a pop out effect while still maintaining a unified image if that makes any sense. At this point, I felt like the light exposure on her was too bright while the background was too dark. So I reduced the output of the light from TTL zero to TTL minus 1.7, which resulted in this next shot. Although this shot is underexposed at TTL minus 1.7, it's exactly the level of light that I wanted it in terms of ambient light, in terms of main light hitting her, and as well as the direction of the rim light being more off axis to kind of just kind of gently get the arm around her and not be too much prominent on the front of the arm. When I took this shot, I had already envisioned what I'm about to show you next, which is just the colors tweaked as well as the exposure tweaked up one stop. So I'm gonna show you guys that. This is the colors tweaked and this right here is the exposure bumped up one stop. This is exactly what I envisioned when I took the shot. So I ended up really liking it as well as because of her expressions great, 
her pose is great and everything just worked out in this shot so i ended up choosing this shot and editing it and making a video for this for this building the shot series one thing i do want to state is that because i know there's gonna be people out there that say why don't you just adjust the settings in camera while you're shooting if i see the level of ambient light and flash exposure exactly where i need it to be on the back of the screen i'll just keep shooting because i can just raise the exposure and post and take a couple of seconds there rather than waste a couple of seconds while i'm shooting when every single second counts especially which is going to be the case whenever i'm shooting at sunset where every single second counts so as i said before i liked her expression i liked the shadows i liked everything about the shot as well as the composition and i just really liked the shot so i edited it this is the shot without any edits but now i want to show you the same shot edited this right here is the shot edited i'll show you guys every single step right now in photoshop so what you're seeing right here is the final edited version, but I'm gonna go ahead and just take off all the different layers so you can see how the shot looks unedited. That's the shot right there. First thing that I did is remove a lot of the distractions in the image that just kind of just detract from the subject. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys that layer. This pretty much consisted of clone stamp and the heating tool. It's a very tedious thing, but I think it's worth it in terms of just getting that focus directly on the subject. The second thing I did was add a lot of dodge and burn I'll show you guys exactly what that is. Let me go ahead and just make this image 100%. I'll show you guys exactly what I mean. So this right here, this is the level of dodge that I did right there. It might not seem like much, but I'm gonna go ahead and hold down Alt and click on the layer mask. And that's gonna show you exactly everything that I dodged. All of that white that you're seeing on the screen right now, that's everything that I brightened up. I also burned some spots, which you guys can see here. And I'm gonna go, go ahead and show you guys all the areas that I burned. And now I also dodged a little bit of, of her entirely. So I'm gonna show you guys that. Just very subtle. And I also added a little bit of contrast. I always love doing this by adding a levels adjustment layer and raising up the levels to like six, about six. You guys can see the difference right here, right there. I also improved the contrast by just making it a little bit brighter, which is what you're seeing right here. I also went ahead and adjusted the colors. So I did this through selective colors. All the stuff that you're seeing on the screen right now is what I did to everything but her. So you can see that it's not really affecting her, but everything around her. I also went ahead and did the opposite and wanted to affect the colors just on her. So I did that this way. The main thing that I did was what you're seeing right here with the yellows. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys see that and also maybe the reds. Yeah, everything, I think I only messed with the reds and the yellows. And again, all of this stuff that I'm doing, everything that I'm doing is just kind of just playing around and seeing what works and what doesn't work. I would definitely recommend you guys experimenting, having fun with, with anything in terms of editing in Photoshop. That was the colors, contrast, dodge and burn, and distractions so far. And the very last thing I did, or one of the last things I did was frequency separation on her leg and on, on her arm and on her face just a little bit. I think I reduced the opacity to 65%. And I'm gonna just go ahead and just zoom in so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Focus on her cheek and her, her body and her armpit. And that's where you'll see the differences right now. Um, you, can, you can see that this next layer says dress wrinkles plus lip. So you can see that on the bottom of her lip, there's that little mark there. I didn't like it, so I just got rid of it. And I also got rid of just some wrinkles on her dress. Yeah. Oh, and also her tan line. I think that's like from the shoe strap. And I think aside from that, the last things are liquefy and a little bit of removing of the distractions on oh i removed her finger her fingers from the the bar there because i felt like it was just showing up too much and i think it was safe enough to know that her hand is there but i didn't want the fingers to be going through her stomach i also liquefied the body and that's that's pretty much it that's everything that i did for this image if you guys have any questions at all actually before i end this video i want to show you the behind the scenes because i did take one and i took it in a bit of a unique way oh and in case you guys are wondering that whole edit maybe took around 40 minutes and if I were to be a little bit slower and usually watching something like Game of Thrones, for example, it might've taken like an hour, an hour and a half. I know there's people out there who definitely don't wanna spend that amount of time, more than five minutes on every single photo. And if you guys don't wanna do that, you don't have to. The straight out camera shots that I took, I was happy with them, but I wanted to give that little, little bit of extra to the photos. So that's why I edit my photos. But now let's go ahead and show you guys the behind the scenes because I did take it in a unique way. If you guys have ever experimented with photography in terms of the Brennister effect or something that's called bokeh panorama as well, it's as simple as taking a series of photos with a very wide aperture 
and I unintentionally created a Brennerzer slash Bokeh panorama with the behind the scenes. And I did so because I actually couldn't go further back to get an actual one shot behind the scenes because I was already at the side of the road at that point. And if I were to go further back, then I would have gotten hit by a car. So what I did instead was take the shots in portrait orientation and just take them left to right asking everybody to stay exactly where they were and ended up stitching them in Lightroom with the photo merge option. So this is the first shot that I ended up taking where you can see Sam holding the cheetah stand with the Godox 8200 and the Magbox. The next shot you can see is Hillary and the Magbox and the 8200 and a little bit of Sam. The next shot you can see is a little bit more to the right of that, a little bit more to the right of that. And finally, in this last shot, you can see the Nano stand holding the Godox 8400 Pro with the 24 by 24 inch softbox that's double the fuse firing. A lot of people always ask me if in my behind the scenes shots if the light's firing or if I'm using the mind lap and typically I'm using the behind the scenes photos for a daytime shot and if I were to use the mind lamps in the daytime the light wouldn't be anywhere near as powerful with the mind lap as it would be with using the strobe and firing. So I, I want you guys to know if you ever consider that thought I'm firing the light. I'm not using the mind lamp because the mind lamp would be too weak in the daytime. All right so now everything is talked about hope you guys have no questions but if you do have any questions let me know in the comment section below also let me know your feedback i hope this video has helped you i hope you watch the other videos in this series because i think they're helpful overall and i'll see you guys in the next video take care got the main light here the godax 8200 on ttm minus 1.7 got the beautiful model here right and then we also have the rim light is the godax 8400 pro on i think 63 percent something like that yeah, something like 63%.